Welcome back in, everybody. I'm Ben Parker. I've got Simon Short on board with me today. And uh, I apologize right off the bat. I'm not sure if you're seeing both of us or if you'll see us when we talk, but we'll, we'll figure that out as we go. <laughs> Simon. So anyway, welcome on board. Today we're covering what the start of a series of several different coaching slash general manager slash coordinator positions at the NFL level. And we're going to be covering not only the guys who were let go, but the guys that we think might come in, and more specifically, the people we want to show up in some of these positions is really where we're heading at today. So if you're watching this platform on YouTube, we appreciate you being in here as always. If you're listening to one of our podcasts, that is the Stat Sheet Podcast that me, Simon, and Ronan do every week, welcome on board to that. If you're listening through the Simon Short link as well, he's got his own podcast, comes out in the middle of the week, so we are loaded. Simon, how's it going, man? What's up? Ben, it's fantastic. It's a Saturday afternoon. You and I have a rare time on the weekend where the the, the families are um, not impeding what's important in our lives, and that's talking to just each other about the NFL, right? The most important thing. Uh, thrilled to be here. Happy to be back on Sports and Money. Um, really excited to talk about the coaching carousel. Let's jump right in. We're going to get derailed many times. It's just what you and I do. But let's go ahead and at least start off on the right track here. The New England Patriots, they have finally let go of Bill Belichick. I don't think to anyone's surprise, we've been hearing this for weeks and weeks. And really for the past year and a half or so, there's at least been some chatter about it. So I don't think anybody was surprised. But still, once it actually happens, um, it's a little bit shocking to see a guy who's been that good at his job for that long let go. And it was fairly obvious that he didn't want to be let go. So let's get started there. How did you feel about that? Do you think it was the right call, the right time? How do you feel? Definitely the right time. Um, maybe a year too late, which is funny because, you know, Bill Belichick was famous for being out on guys maybe a year early rather than a be, uh, be a year late. So it's only a uh, football justice that happens the other way. Um, I try to be not a homer uh, when I do these things, but I just have to – point out as a Steeler fan I'm wearing the hoodie that it's funny that Tom Brady's last pass with the Patriots was an interception of the Titans and Belichick's last game was a loss to the Jets you gotta you, you love to see it um but in all seriousness I think it was the right time because the team was clearly just stuck in this perpetual loop of Belichick trying to find the right mix of coaches that he had both comfort with and that would help uh, move this roster and this franchise forward again after Tom Brady left to go to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, the most recent attempt at that was Bill O'Brien bringing him from Alabama to be the OC. The first real, well, first real OC sounds a little dramatic, but uh, after a year with no real offensive coordinator um, between Matt Patricia and Joe Judge helming that position, Bill O'Brien was like, okay, like, can we get back to baseline normalcy, right? We said before the start of the season, Still not great talent, and the ceiling still isn't very high, but can the baseline of a normal NFL offense with an experienced play caller and the you know scheme designer help this franchise? And it didn't. It was still a bottom five offense. They bench Mac Jones, go to Bailey Zappi in the middle of the year. It's It was clear that just nothing was going to work. We went from Cam Newton, Jarrett Stidham, Mac Jones, Bailey Zappi, no real offensive identity or, or plan of attack. Um, for the Patriots and you know they wanted to go another way just last year they reworked the deal with Gerard Mayo who is now the head coach um, when everyone was talking about him being you know blocked for head coaching interviews trying to do head coach interviews maybe go somewhere be a DC for a year and then be a head coach and the Patriots were able to keep him as a position coach um, and not just a position coach but like a co-position coach with a Bel one of the Belichick sons as a linebackers coach and so we all kind of had an idea that that meant like there was a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. He'd be the successor to Bill Belichick. Um, but it, we find out, you know, Rappaport was the first I saw, but uh, many people reported this, that there was actually writing in Mayo's contract to be the successor to Bill Belichick. Um, so there, there was already a plan in place. So we knew it was going to be sooner rather than later. And after just, you know, three, four years of, no real identity, no real direction, the wheel spinning for the offense. Um, definitely the right time. Yeah, it, it's the right time for New England. I I was still am a little bit shocked at how bad the Patriots offense was without Tom Brady for the past three, four seasons. And this year especially, 
you know, I thought with Bill O'Brien coming in that it would get better. I thought it would stabilize. Well, it didn't. It actually got worse. <laughs> if you can believe that, it was worse. And that's not all, all O'Brien's fault. But the talent level there on the offense is dreadful. The defenses were still good. I think we still saw basically, give or yep. take, yep. the same defensive consistencies and the same characteristics that we'd saw 20 years ago from the Patriots. So that stayed. And then, you know, the organizational stability, for whatever that's worth, and that is something, that all stayed. But when Brady left, well, everything went to, went to pot there on the offensive side of the football. And you could see not only how good the quarterback had been for so long, which we all knew, but then you could see for sure, wow, there's nothing here on offense. I mean, absolutely nothing. They can still shift a little bit with running backs and stuff, but against legit defenses, that's not going to get you much without Brady making all these perfect calls and perfect throws. I mean, it's just not. And so I was I was really amazed at how quickly it dropped off on the offensive side of the football and that he couldn't get it back together. Maybe if he got another good quarterback in, but that's not easy to do, and uh, they hadn't been able to do it in four years. So anything else there on the Patriots side? Eventually, we're going to talk about a potential Bill Belichick, Josh McDaniels reunion. I'm sure New England and Robert Kraft, thinking about timing of it, saw McDaniels being out there, saw the offense be dreadful again, and thought, am I really going to do a third or fourth stint with Josh McDaniels coming in to fix this offense? Which, like, probably would have happened a little bit, right? I mean, McDaniels was last there in 2021, Mac Jones' first year. uh, And they were the 10th best offense by DVOA. Mac Jones went to the freaking Pro Bowl. And now that guy... Might not be on the Patriots next year. Um, so I bet they were seeing, oh man, Josh McDaniels is coming back. We gotta get we before this whole thing starts again, we gotta get this guy out of here. So uh yeah, that that that's it for the Patriots. We'll see where those two maybe meet up later on down the road. I'll take it a step further. We were even the, the media, national media was even running to Scott Pioli, the general manager from 10, 12 years ago, and asking mm-hmm. him, Hey, what would you think about bringing the band back together? Basically, because that was it. We keep Belichick. We keep all the defensive people. We bring McDaniels back. Maybe we even bring Pioli back because at least it's a general manager that probably wouldn't have a power struggle with Bill, right? And we kind of bring, well, without Brady, it's just not going to work. It's not going to be very good. And I think everybody seemed to know that. But, man, you're like, dang it. This is a coach that other people still might want. And this is a coach that did a lot of winning for us. So is there any way we can fix this? And it just didn't look like it was going to happen. It was getting worse and worse, not better. So I'm okay with that. Uh, Seahawks. I think this was the one that surprised me the most. This was oh, yeah. not the one I saw coming. Um, when I when I think of Pete Carroll, I thought the energy was still there. They were close in the playoffs this year, and I think they what they made the playoffs last year, right, and lost to the 49ers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They've had tons of winning seasons. It hasn't been getting worse, and this is the one that surprised me. I know why they did it. I, I get it, but still, it's the one that surprised me. Yeah, um, there's a lot that I think we're going to continue to learn about this decision to move on from Pete Carroll. You know, you you watch the press conference that Pete had um, just when the season had ended before they did their end of season meetings, before he obviously was let go. And we we saw a guy that was energized and still wanting to coach, saying he's not tired, he's not done, all this stuff. And... Less than a week later, we get this press conference with him coming out saying his goodbyes to the team and to the players and hinting slowly at – not really hinting, very clear about the fact that he still wanted the job. Uh, he he made sure not to mince words. In fact, you watch that press conference, and as cordial and as respectful as he's being to the Seahawks organization and how uh, congratulatory he is to his buddy John Schneider, who's the GM, who's been the GM the whole time. You know, that that Schneider's in, still keeping the job. He's going to lead the head coaching search, all this stuff. But Carol was very sure to let everybody know, I didn't, I wanted to be the coach. This, this wasn't, uh, I agreed to not be the coach, but this wasn't, a, I agreed that I should not be the coach. He wanted that job for him. He wanted that job for the players. He wanted that job for his coaching staff. Um, all very surprising. The only thing I can really there's there's actually two things I can point to. Um, there there's some rumors out there that the Seahawks as an organization want to move on to a younger new quarterback, and that doesn't mean Drew Locke, I don't think, but it probably means like being aggressive in the draft and getting ready for the next step. Whereas Pete Carroll was very much on the no, we can still win this thing with Geno, uh, which I fully endorse by the way. Um, the other thing that's easier to point at. And we talked about on the Statue podcast this week, actually, is there doesn't seem to be a positive direction 
insight for the defense under Pete Carroll, unfortunately. And that's because, okay, you have some good players. You've had some nice drafts. You've brought in some good defense pieces, signs, signings, trades, drafts. And this defense is a bottom 10, bottom seven defense for the last, what, three, four years now. And the other route you could take to rectify that is, okay, bringing in a new defensive coordinator, right? We talked about like, could Wing Markendale go there? Only problem is you, you're not going to get a high profile DC to come in with Pete Carroll as the head coach. So with no real route to fixing the defense, no matter what you do on offense, even if you want wanted to stick with Geno as an organization or not, there's no clear route to fixing this defense. That's super obvious. Um, P. Carroll referenced in an interview that he did on the radio, uh, I think just either, I think just yesterday, Friday, um, that he had so many like very specific things, very specific ideas to fix not, you know, the stuff on the team, which I'm sure, uh, you know, is, is primarily on the defense. He had, he had plans for players and plans for how they were going to change up the scheme and, and all this stuff. And he even said, quote, the, the people that made the decision were, quote, non-football people. So, like, they don't understand that stuff. They don't they don't get the things that I'm I'm trying to do to a, to a finer point. And all of this stuff still tells me that this guy's going to be a coach next year. They're, between his energy and his, his vigor for it and the way he talked about, like, how much he still wants a Super Bowl and how much he still wants to connect with players, um, this guy's not done. So, so for the Seahawks, was it the right move? Maybe. Because, yeah, you, I don't know if you fix that defense. I, I think that's the main thing that trips me up. But, man, from a – it feels like the team was still right there. And, and the NFC, we don't know what's going to happen here this offseason and here in these playoffs. But uh, it's it's tough to see that guy go for how much he still loves the organization and, and wants to do it and still is one of the better coaches in the NFL. It's still the one that surprised me the most, I think. We've got another one we're going to cover as well that, that was not – I did not really expect, but didn't surprise me as much as this one. It's amazing, though, that somebody with as much success as Pete Carroll has had and recent success, it, it's amazing that they would still let him go. And you mentioned he's been he's been there with John Schneider for a long time. It's not as if they had a new GM come in who, who wanted to run things a different way. I almost wonder, and people, people will say, no, nah, this can't happen, but it happened to Pete. I almost wonder if John's not worried about his job security because now you start to look at how many seasons you haven't done anything significant. It's less about competing at this point, and it's more about, well, now we haven't done anything significant in a while here. And then you start to look at the general manager sideways as well. So I wonder if this wasn't even a move that John John Schneider himself was like, man, I hate to do it, but it's maybe a year from now it's both of us out the door. <laughs> so yeah. I better save my butt while I can. And I, I think that may be a part of it as well. We won't know because neither, neither guy will admit it, but um, that may be a part of it as well. When you look at the, the defense for the uh, Seahawks, it's been a while now, probably six, seven years that the defense has at least been a question mark. It's not that they've been bad every year. They haven't. But even under Ken Norton from 18 to 21, you know, there were a couple of seasons in there, and that's why they had to let him go. It's because it's like, man, we've got some decent decent pieces on this roster on the defensive side of the football, and yet we're still not performing like we used to. And the winning has really dropped off in terms of significant, man, this was a dynasty in the making right here until it wasn't. <laughs> and then they're just, they're struggling to get in the playoffs, you know? And that's, uh, I, I think that lead lends itself into it as, as well. Um, so we'll see more thoughts here on, on Pete. Uh, no more thoughts. Just, just, you know, again, this one's not as clear cut and obvious as the Belichick one, probably because the issues are on defense instead of offense. Um, but there, when you just look at the football stuff, there there are some pretty easy things to point at uh, in, in terms of how how it how it does make sense, but still shocking nonetheless. Yeah, and I've got more thoughts on the Seahawks. We'll save that for our next episode when we're actually covering who who might be coming into oh, Seattle. Yeah. Oh yeah, this one surprised me some, surprised a lot of people, but I uh, I don't think it necessarily surprised everybody. So the Tennessee Titans, um, Vrabel is gone. Uh, this this again is is not something that does a complete shock because I think everybody knows the stat by now. He lost sixteen out of twenty one, had two back to back not good seasons, and yeah, I, I I really expected that he would get a pass because they knew they were kind of remaking the roster, and because it seemed like he won a power struggle uh, during the last off season, and yet here he goes, he's out the door. So thoughts on the Titans letting go of Brabel? Yeah, we we learned a lot by how this one went down, I think. Um, so 
you mentioned it when, when they brought in Rand Carthen from the 49ers, we thought that was Rabel winning. Well, the, the like floating rumors we've been getting in piece by piece over the last year or so is that like Carthen wasn't Rabel's guy. Like that wasn't a Rabel decision, maybe to move on from John Robbins was, but not Carthen specifically. Um, and we've seen this team in the draft continue to look towards the future. We've seen we we you know Derrick Henry make his impassioned speech and and probably not being back with Tennessee. Ryan Tannehill saying that he was pretty sure Week 18 was his last game and and piece by piece we've seen the Rabel Titans kind of leave. Um, so now what we're what that leads us to believe was this team was already planning for what their future, what their next era was going to be. And when the team not only announced that Rabel wouldn't be the head coach next year, but he was being fired. And and they put out the press release that that went along with that. It was very obvious what all this meant. So I'm going to read a bit of this here. Um, quote, as the NFL continues to innovate and evolve, I believe the team's best position for sustained success will be those who empower an aligned and collaborative team across all football functions. End quote. So that comes from ownership. Basically saying <laughs> we have a new plan for this organization and Vrabel wasn't on board. So whether... Rabel continued to push back on this idea of moving into the next phase of this team, uh, you know, starting with the trade of A.J. Brown for Traylon Burks, or from the beginning, they didn't view Rabel as the guy to usher them into that, right? whether it was they didn't think he was the right fit for a rookie quarterback, they didn't feel like they wanted to make it around the run game, whatever it is, they decided that Rabel was not a, like the right coach for what they want to do next. Um, so this was a very... A very clear cut and direct uh, mention on him, I think, that was that this isn't our guy anymore. Not so much the Carol and Belichick where it's like we have to try something new, like parting ways. Yeah, all this nicety. This was Rabel's out. Um, whereas for the whole year, I didn't even think he was going to be out. And, and anyone that did think it was going to be more like he wanted to leave to go to the Patriots or the Titans were going to say, um, OK, you kind of want to leave. We kind of want to do something. Let's see if we can get some picks for it. No, they just they just fired him. And their explanation was funny on on the trade. People were like, why didn't you try to trade him? They're like, eh, we thought it would take too long. So there's some old school in there, like no must, no fuss. That, But they were they were just ready to be done and, and move on. So that was really interesting, Ben. I think you're dead on with that, especially the ownership part here. Because, and listen, you and I have talked about Vrabel before. We, we know where we are on that. I, I like Vrabel as coach. I didn't have him as a top ten. You do, and so do a lot of other people. There are a lot of other people out there who were endorsing the trade idea or the move to New England idea because they do have Vrabel as a top 10, top eight kind of a coach. But I, one thing's for certain, if Vrabel is my coach, I'm not looking for somebody else. Why, why switch out? He knows what he's doing. If you give him a good enough roster, now listen, I'm going to question his roster building abilities, but if you give him a good roster, I don't doubt that he can take that team to a Super Bowl. I have no problem with that. You know, they're going to be ready each week. They're going to game plan each week. They're going to be close and competitive each week. I, I like all of that. So so I wouldn't have let go of Rabel. I don't think it was the right decision here. But, listen, when Adam Amy uh, – sorry, Amy Adam Strunk came in as the owner, she's been a part of this for a long time. But when she actually got controlling ownership, you know, three years ago, three or four years ago, when she got that and started to work her way in, the first thing they did was try Robinson as GM. Well, that that didn't work out. They they moved on quick from there, and they've obviously got ideas they want to go. Both her and the people whose whose voices uh, have her ear. So they've got a direction they want to go, and I don't think Brabel fits it. And I think they're wanting probably to go newer, younger, sleeker, more offensive. Is probably the direction they're going to go. I think that's what we're going to see out of them. Not that I have a problem with that direction, but still. When you've got a Vrabel, I think you sit down with Vrabel and you tell him, hey, you need a better OC. And it might need to be a younger OC, somebody who's going to be more innovative and creative. That's the direction I would have gone. Whether or not he wanted to go in that direction, I don't know. <laughs> that might have been a big problem for him. So in any case, I wouldn't have let him go. I would have continued. I would have just told him, hey, if, if you don't want to do what we're suggesting, you've got another year or two and then that's it. So, you know. Maybe he's comfortable with that. Maybe he's okay with the idea of, hey, I can go coach somewhere else and not put up with this. So I know he can go back to college anytime he wants. And there's probably a couple of NFL teams that are going to jump on him this season. So oh, yeah. maybe he was comfortable enough with that to just tell them to get lost. And I would be too. You know, if I was pretty confident in what I had been able to do, confident that other people would hire me to do a similar job, 
then I would have no problem telling ownership to take a hike because I'm just not interested in playing the games your way. Yeah, uh, I think it, it is tied to the offense and it's tied to the quarterback situation. I mean, we saw him bury Malik Willis last year. We, we saw him be competitive in a couple games where he was forced to start Malik Willis last year. Um, and then there were on Titans Twitter some conspiracies about how he felt about Levis. And, and this is all about the Titans saying, OK, we have Levis. We need to actually empower this guy and build around him. And, and if Rabel wasn't on board with that and you're worried about like, well, maybe he was interested in in the Patriots job. Maybe he could be interested in something else. If he's not giving you the full confidence that he's in the same direction, and I mean, it's crazy to say, but it's 2024 now, Ben. Um, the second round pick at quarterback who played well for six games ends up with a little bit more power than even the good head coach <laughs> who has had two losing seasons in a row. Like we're already in that phase, which is so crazy because, you know, even 10 years ago, uh, no chance of that, right? No chance of that. Um, if the head coach, even going through some struggles, doesn't like a, a day two rookie quarterback, the team's fine with that, and they they move on. They let him make the decision. But that here we are in twenty twenty four, and you get on board with the guy they like, or you know, we'll we'll find somebody who is. Yeah, and I really think we we talked about the last hire, the 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 Seattle or not the hire, the fire, the Seattle situation. It was a non football or decision made by non football people. That is exactly what is going on here in Tennessee. Because if you're a football kind of a person, you just like football, then you're a Vrabel kind of guy. But, man, that is not what is happening here. If you're the older, you're sitting in the owner's box every week and you're watching this team lose two years in a row. And you're watching a coach who's doing things a little bit more old school than the way you're, you're liking to see. And especially, this is the kicker, when you're sitting in that owner's box every week and you're watching Anthony Richardson for the Colts, and Shane Steichen, and you're like, oh, that's nice. And then you look over at Jacksonville, and you see Doug Peterson and his flexibility and his creativity, and Trevor Lawrence. You're like, oh, that's a shiny new car. And then, to top it off, <laughs> you look over at Houston, and you see D'Amico Ryans, who's a defensive guy. He's a defensive guy, mm -hmm. and yet they are lighting it up with C.J. Stroud. And then you look back over here, and you see what looks like an old car that doesn't want to be made new, that doesn't want to do anything new, doesn't want to go with the new quarterback, the, the fun way. And then you look at the upcoming draft and you see Caleb Williams and you see Drake May and you see a Jalen Daniels or Jaden Daniels. I got the two mixed up. Apologize. You see those names and you're like, mm, that looks nice. But my coach doesn't want any of those guys. You know, he wants to go sign Kirk Cousins or whoever the heck, you know. I can understand why ownership is thinking this way, even though I wouldn't. But this is exactly what's happening. It's more of, hey, we want new fun offense trendy stuff and this old stuff just gonna be out the door yes uh it's funny you mentioned kirk cousins because in our future segment i have rabel and kirk cousins linked so we are we're on the same page there <laughs> why not all right uh we'll talk about, more about the titans in our uh upcoming series but the falcons let go of arthur smith not a surprise but still, I don't know if everybody was on board with it. So I'm interested to see how you feel about it specifically, if you liked it or if you didn't. Yeah, I loved it. Uh, listen, I, I hate to cheer for people being fired, but sometimes uh, it, it just has to happen, uh, whether it's Josh McDaniels midway through this season or Arthur Smith here at the end of the year. And I was a little worried because, you know, they had that. Did they have that win? And was it week 16 where they beat up on the Colts, right? Or week 17, week 16. Somewhere in there, yeah. Um, and they, they beat up on the Colts. They won by like over a touchdown. And I was just like, oh, man, OK, maybe Arthur Smith is going to save his job here. So good on the Falcons for three years into this thing, not being satisfied with seven wins, eight wins, seven wins, what, you know, whatever it was, um, because this clearly was going – way downhill fast uh you, you go back to arthur smith here early on in the regular season you know arguing with media members and going on these long rants about people not knowing ball and, and all this stuff and you get to the desmond ritter situation talk about like uh doing wrong by your day to quarterback you know say what you want about ritter but what they did with him this year was clearly in in panic and in not well thought out not well planned um, and in response to not having a good development strategy for him over the course of last year in the offseason, um, you know, you talk about not starting him until the last four weeks of last year. 
to whatever, you know, bringing in a, a, an expensive backup this year in the offseason, maybe not giving him your full attention, right? Because you knew you had a Taylor Heineke to fall back on. And then benching Ritter at multiple points and bringing him back in multiple times during the season. So any confidence that owner Arthur Blank or, or the front office had in Desmond Ritter is probably sapped because of what Arthur Smith did. And then let alone everything about Kyle Pitts and Bijan Robinson and, and, and um, Drake London. I have some, no, nah, mind. I won't get into that right now, but uh, Arthur Smith and the Falcons definitely makes sense. I wouldn't have been surprised if they had kept him just in the, like it's the NFC South. We were, we were in it until week 18. There's still a chance. But I think everything ended, especially the last half of the half of the season, in such a like tire fire for them. That uh, definitely the right move, Ben. Three consecutive seasons of seven and ten for Arthur Smith. Mm. Negative point differentials in every year. The first year was negative one hundred and forty six. We didn't start off great, and this past year is negative fifty two. And this past season saw him do a number of questionable things. Even if you like him as a person, as a coach, which I think I do, I think. I think he's got a place in this league, and I, I admire some of the things that he's done. But some of the decision-making this year, especially at quarterback, the flip-flopping back and forth, the explanations for things that almost seemed as if he thought we were dumb enough to believe those explanations was insulting. You really don't want to insult people unless you have to. I mean, listen, if you're Belichick or Greg Popovich, by all means, go ahead and insult everybody because you don't give a crap because you're so good. You can afford to not. And all the rest of us need to worry about that a little bit. And – you know, that seemed to really be the nail in the coffin. The fact that they didn't seem too too interested in using all, using all their nice, new, shiny toys on offense, didn't seem too worried about that. I'm sure that played into it as well. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, it just comes back to winning. It's 7-10, and 10, three years in a row. You're only three years as Falcons head coach, and that's I. it's extremely rare, unbelievably rare to see any coach anywhere last for a fourth season when they've got three consecutive losing ones. So – um, and you mentioned it, the way they fell apart there at the end of the year. And, and, the, and the owner mentioned it. Some of the bad losses to bad teams during the year. Yep. And you're like, dang it, man. We should have won those. You know, we mm-hmm. should be in the playoffs instead of Tampa Bay. All of that combined, not surprised at all here. Any uh, Anything else uh, as Arthur Smith heads out the door here? Nah, don't let the door hit you. <laughs> all right. Uh, last one we're going to cover for today is the Washington Commanders. Um This one was the least surprising of all. Everybody, I think, including Ron Rivera, knew that this was coming, even though maybe he, too, was holding out hope until the end. But uh, Ron Rivera was let go. And everybody's been talking about this for a long time, so nobody was surprised by it. But did you have any different feeling on it at all? No, especially the way the year played out. I mean, even before the season started, when he brings in Eric Biennemi to be the OC, it, it felt pretty clear and, you know, I, I know our, our guy Robertson Byer, your co-host on Odds on Favorite, w- was uh, in on this boat for a little while, was it felt like Ron Rivera was bringing in the enemy because – and he was he was still there because ownership, new ownership was coming in. Let's have a little bit of stability here. And it felt like Rivera was going to position himself to try and get into the front office after one more year of coaching, right? He He's older. He's been through a – ridiculous tenure here with the commanders um obviously battled illness all of this stuff um so it felt like he was like let me bring in the high profile oc who deserves uh his shot at a head coaching job let him have a successful offensive year let's continue to do the seven to nine win thing that we do and i can move into a cushy front office job and you know retire and you know, I'll, I'll be good to go um and then very quickly, the year told us that that was not going to be the case. Um, th- this is you you run a department store and uh, you you get a new owner, you get a new manager coming in from corporate that like takes over for the short term. And you're like, oh, yeah, man, no, no, like things are going really well. And they get there and they're like, this isn't how we're supposed to do this at all. Like who and, and I don't have that institutional knowledge with you to know like why some of these things are wrong, right? Like why why those uh why why those displays are all wrong all the time, why the staff never shows up on time, why we close <laughs> five minutes before we're supposed to every day. Um, what are you talking about here? Get get out. Um, so Josh Harris and and co were kind of walking in thinking we have this stable head coach who's going to deliver like an okay season and we'll see what happens. And then the 
the year just went completely off the rails. So, yeah, like you said, no surprise here. New owner. They just hired their GM, um, Adam Peters, coming from the San Francisco 49ers. Very fresh, very clean slate, second overall pick in the draft. Um, no surprise here, Ben. No surprise. The only surprise that there was for me was how bad this defense was this year. No, I was not one of the group of people, thankfully, because I've had enough bad takes, but I was not one of the group of people that said, hey, this is a championship defense heading into the year. I looked at it and said, no way. There's, It's just not. Other people were. It wasn't just not that. It was awful. This was a dreadful joke of a defense, and that was before they let go of the edge rushers. I mean, that was before. So I, it, it was amazing to me how quickly that fell apart on defense. And then Howell showed us some nice things for a while, and then that too fell off, which, you know, taking a beating the way – Ron Rivera knows more about football than I will ever know. And yet, mm-hmm. you look at some of the crap here that has gone on. They suck at linebacker. They suck on the offensive line. He's been there long enough to have fixed all of this for the defense to go straight into the tank for no explicable reason. I mean, none of it made sense. For them to not know what they want to do at quarterback. And you're like, man, you know. And, and it's stuff like this that allows people like you and me, who have not worked in the league, to legitimately question what other people who are working in the league do are doing. Because it just seems so obvious. <laughs> like, what are you doing here? You know, I I still don't know what they've been doing in some of these cases, but it didn't work out. Everybody knew it. Ron Rivera was going to need to make the playoffs to save his job anyway, because I know ownership wanted to clean house, and that's everybody. That's everybody in the building. So they, they did not want to keep anybody around. I don't think they're going to. They needed to make the playoffs or this was going to happen. And honestly, even if they had made the playoffs this year, if they didn't next year, they were out the door then. So this was going to happen at some point, just as soon as the ownership had a legit reason. And, oh, by the way, <laughs> Rivera and company gave them every reason this year to just go ahead and cut this thing off because <laughs> <Two, laughs> it was awful. <laughs> two weeks ago when Rivera sat at the at the podium and said, for the last three years I've been managing. For the last five years I've been coaching. Well, they lost eight games in a row uh, over through that uh, five-week span he was talking about, and they were very <laughs> poorly managed for the last three years. So, uh, listen, Rivera came into a really bad situation, obviously had a very bad situation from a health and personal standpoint, and it just – it was never it was never meant, meant to be long-term, unfortunately. So, uh, listen, Rivera, just – Man, go retire. Go go enjoy your life. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's time to move on. Yeah, I have lots of respect for him, of course, and I wish mm-hmm. him nothing but the best. But the time here as head coach, unfortunately, this was the end and everybody knew it. All right. Uh, I think as far as people being fired or let go from the head coaching spot, that's all we want to hit. Anything else you want to tagline before we exit out of this episode, man? You want to quickly rank these jobs if you're a head coach, which which one you want of these seven that are remaining? It. Yeah, right, we so we're seven gonna, still left. Yeah, we're going to include the the midseason firings of Chargers and, and Raiders and, and uh, Panthers in this. We won't include the Patriots, obviously, because that's taken. Um, but Ben, uh, how would you rank these jobs, man? What do you think? So let me just start off with my favorite, and I'm pretty sure it's the Chargers, and it is because of yep. Justin Herbert. No, I, I personally, and I think you're on board. I, I'm interested to see if, if, if you agree or not. I personally think the salary cap issues have been overblown as I've looked at them, and I haven't dived deep into them. As I've looked into them, I think the Saints, the Buccaneers, and the Eagles all have way more messy, complicated, okay. nasty cap situations than the Chargers do. I feel like the Chargers, if they cut out some of these veterans on defense, can get themselves right back in a competitive cap situation. Yeah. And that's I'm not sure that that's not better. Maybe you keep one of them, and then you can just always do what the Eagles are doing, and that, that is just restructure the crap out of everything and just keep moving that way, even though you're limiting yourself somewhat in, in certain flexibility situations long term. But if the Eagles can do it, why not you? I, I don't think the cap situation is as big a deal for the Chargers the Herbert spot there, if you put a good guy with him, I think that's the most appealing job for me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the one of these jobs that has a legitimate franchise quarterback. Um, other ones, you're you're dealing with a rookie, which like can, is enticing in its own way. You're dealing with a draft pick, clean slate. Um, you've got a like 
relatively reliable and relatively team friendly deal and like a Geno Smith that you can work with for for a year or two. Um, but this is one where you've got a guy who uh, I still think is the top five quarterback in this league. I know others do not. Um, but at least you can say certainly has the potential to do that if I do a good job with it. Um, and I totally agree with what you said about the defense. They're clear they're it's not a good cap situation because they're they are very much in the red, but it's a very clear right. way to fix it. And then not just, oh, just cut these guys, but cut the expensive guys from the bad defense who are with the last defensive minded head coach. And yeah, I mean, it would suck to cut a guy like Khalil Mack, who just had a great, you know, at least statistical right. season. It would. A Joey Bosa who you draft so early and, and invest in but hasn't lived up to the expectation has been hurt for years. Um, Eric Kendricks, who uh, you can is a veteran and and you can very easily move on from, from a cap standpoint. And then, Oh, by the way that, you know, there's also the Corey Lindsley situation who is probably retiring with uh, the heart condition that he discovered he had at the beginning of the season. Um, however, the savings works with, with like medical retirements and such, it, it can very quickly fix itself and they can be back in the black in terms of the money. Um, and then they can start over from defense. And uh, I, I think that's very exciting. So yeah, Chargers number one for me, for sure. I agree. Cause I, and again, I haven't gone into every nook and cranny of their cap situation, but basically within one, two off seasons, one calendar year, this off season, next off season, you can get yourself back in a pretty decent cap situation yeah. fairly quickly. And even there, you can always do the Eagles, Buccaneers, Saints mode of, hey, just restructure the guys we really want to keep. Let the others go. Don't get, don't try to hoard all these veterans on defense. Some of them need to go anyway. It's just good to, good to kind of keep a little bit of freshness coming in too. So that's where I'm at. Uh, I'm interested to see. So we agree on number one. What's your number two? Uh, I would, I, I would say the Commanders. I think, um, because it's totally clean slate. You have a brand new ownership who's got a new way to think about the NFL. Um. Uh, it's funny. I was I was kind of chuckling when when not because Rivera was fired, but when Rivera was fired, everyone was like, "This is such an attractive job. You've got the five picks in the top one hundred. You've got all this cap space." And I still have that gut reaction of like, "It's the Commanders." But man, you've got new ownership. It, it, this is such yeah. a different place to be. And you've got the second overall pick. Um, you uh, I mentioned it earlier, but going and quickly de- putting a team together to go get Adam Peters um, tells me that this ownership group this decision making process is going to be quick aggressive efficient we'll talk about it here in a little while um i think they're gonna go be able to go get whoever they want and i think you feel good about that as a coach you've got a gm who everyone really wants you've got a lot of opportunities here in terms of thinking about like my job security right and, and having the opportunity to really build something for a few years i'd have the commanders at two I've got the Commanders as a three-way tie, basically, with the, with two other teams that I like, too. But let me agree on the Commanders first. It is a new look. It's a fresh look. And you feel like the energy is in the building. You just feel it. You feel like, hey, it may be a while before the new stadium gets here, but we're going to get one in a few years, maybe eight, ten years before it actually gets here. But we're looking forward to that. Um, we've got a completely – we're completely cleaning house. We get to start all over again. The roster has plenty of pieces that you can do something with. It's not as if it is a bad roster. It just has holes in it that need to be fixed. You mentioned Adam Peters coming on board. He's been a well-regarded, sought-after, to a degree, Mm -hmm. GM working over with the 49ers. So, you know, you feel good about everything here. Um, You've got a high draft pick this year. If you want to make a run at one of these quarterbacks, you feel like you've got a shot at that. So I like it here. I, there's no reason for me not to want to go to the commanders. It's a whole new world. And hopefully it doesn't change the way, you know, another organization we're going to talk about here is. Hopefully that doesn't change. Hopefully they keep the energy in the building. Hopefully you're going to get a new name on the team and, and actually get more of an identity yep. there. And, and we're just continue to make it more fun uh, to be a commanders fan again. So I'm with you. I think this is a great job. I've got it tied with two other teams here, but I'm with you. What teams do you have it tied with? So here are the next two. It's the Atlanta Falcons and it's the Seattle Seahawks. Which one do you want to go with? Uh let me hear let me hear your take on Seattle. Um I, I find this one very interesting and you know I'm a big Geno fan from this point of view, but uh I think you're a little boxed in. What do you what do you think about Seattle? See, I I like Seattle. I think it's been a stable franchise for a long time. And this even predates uh this predates Pete Carroll and it predates mm-hmm. John Schneider. 
I mean, mm-hmm. this goes back to the Mike Holmgren days, yep. you know? So for what are we looking at, 25 years now? This mm-hmm. has been an organization that is consistent and has shown under two different regimes that they can get to the Super Bowl. And so I, I like it there. I like the energy there. Now, is is John going to come in and, and be a little quick on the trigger if he thinks his job security is on the line? Maybe. But I like what they've got going on here. I love that they've got young guys on offense and defense that they can go to. Looks like a developing, getting better kind of a roster. So I like that. I I like the fact that they could keep Geno Smith if they, if they want, but it looks like they're not going to do that probably, I'm guessing. Looks like they're going to want the next head coach in, next general manager to go with the young quarterback. But I like the fact that John Schneider typically has been good at drafting. He's had a couple of dud years who hasn't. But I typically like the way he's drafted. I like the way they brought guys in. How much of that goes to Pete Carroll? I don't know. But mm-hmm. I typically like what John has done there. So I like the energy of being able to go there just all across the board. I like that. Uh, I, it feels like ownership has done a pretty good job there. And, the man, the crowds there in Seattle. I mean, the way mm-hmm. they love their <laughs> way they love their team. I, I really like the energy. So that's why I've got them right up here with Commanders and the Falcons. I like them from the standpoint that, again, I feel like I could walk, not actually me personally, off the street. If I were a good NFL head coach candidate, um, I could walk in and still probably do some winning right away. And, oh, by the way, like you said, if I also come in with, like, a vision for the future, right, what we could do with another quarter, uh, a rookie quarterback, how we could spend that money around. But I just feel like from a roster standpoint, you're also kind of, like, boxed into right now. And something we haven't really talked about much is this team is – probably going to it has i think has to be sold in the next year or two it's part of the paul allen will um jody allen took over the team his sister um and and, uh, the earliest time a sale should be starting to be explored on is may 2024 and everyone's talking about jeff bezos buying this team you know being up there in seattle with amazon everything i don't know if i want to work for jeff bezos and i don't know if i want to be the coach coming in for a year or two with a veteran team that might be sold, right? So that's something we don't always talk about from a football standpoint. I like it because you have kind of dual optionality there, but to kind of go off of, go differently from the thing you and I always talk about, um, looking at a potential sale down the line, that that part makes me a little nervous. It's a great point, especially if you're head coach and GM and you're like, man, I'm not sure we're going to do enough winning over the next two seasons to justify a new ownership coming in and keeping us. That's the question. It's not can we compete. I think any coach or GM, John, knows that they can compete. Mm -hmm. But are we winning enough for them to want to keep us because people love to come in and just clean house? I mean, it just – I. We just (laughs) talked about it, yep. Yeah, we just talked about it. So will they like us enough to do that? I can totally understand that. For me, I'm not the kind of guy who likes to just come in and rip everything down and start all over again. I like to just compete right away. So I like it, but it is worth wondering if you're a coach or GM, not a GM, if you're a coach, that's good enough to have your choice of places. Maybe you don't go here just because of that. You're like, Mm -hmm. man, John's needing to win now. New ownership's going to want us to win a lot right away. Maybe let me go somewhere else. That's a fair point. So let's hit the Falcons. Um, I've got them right up here with commanders Mm -hmm. and Seahawks. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I would have them right below commanders and right above seahawks and a lot of people do i've heard a lot of people even say that the falcons job was the best one mainly because of all the offensive weapons that are there but again i'm not going to go there because of that so much although that's a part of it because i still think you've got to get the quarterback thing figured out until you do Mm -hmm. the offensive weapons don't mean a whole lot but that does make it feel good you do feel like hey they're able to get good talent in the building Looks like talent that can actually play on an NFL field, too. It's not just prospects. These guys look pretty good, so I like that part of it. I also like the fact that the Falcons' ownership seems to be very stable. They seem mm-hmm. to be willing to support, maybe more so than than most organizations, because I think a lot of owners are that way. But Arthur Blank really seems to be a guy, and he's not far from me here, two and a half hours away here in my backyard, basically. He seems to be a guy that has deserved more winning than he's gotten, to be quite honest. I can't tell that he's doing things a lot differently than, say, Robert Kraft up in New England that has. They just happen to not get Tom Brady, you know? I can't tell a huge difference here. Um, interestingly enough, the Falcons haven't had a head coach last longer than, I think, seven years. 
in their wow. entire tenure mm. since 1966, whenever they came into the league. It, it's about seven, seven and a half years wow. is the longest ever. Mm. And so, you know, I'm looking for a guy that's going to come in here and stay for the next 20 years. If I'm the Falcons, that's the guy I want to bring in. I think I've got the infrastructure set. I've got people ready to go here. We just need somebody to put it all together, and especially at quarterback. So I like this job, especially because of ownership. Yeah, and, and if I, especially if I'm an offensive-minded, uh, if I'm an OC coming in, um, right. I feel like I can leave that defense alone, which is what you like. You like to be able to focus, if you're, especially if you're a first-time head coach. You come in and you can focus on fixing your side of the ball. And if you have either you go get a, a, a veteran a la like Sean McVay getting Wes Phillips when he just got the first got the Rams job right. Um, you have Ryan Nielsen right there and he improved that defense. He comes over from the Saints defense, which is longtime success. Um, maybe he's not the guy that's there with you for those 20 years. But you come in, you have an offensive line that the team has paid for. You have the weapons that the team has drafted. What you have to do is come in, find the right quarterback, and put together the offensive scheme. That's what you're focusing on. And you let Ryan Nielsen continue to fit, control that defense while it's still kind of in this like semi-veteran, semi-prime of their careers ty uh, uh, type of guys. You've got Grady Jarrett at 31. You've got Jesse Bates at 27. David Onyemata at 32. And then you've got you know, an A.J. Terrell at 26. Um, you can leave that side alone. So, so for that aspect, knowing I got some the the pieces on offense, I just need to come in and figure out the quarterback situation. I could leave the defense alone for a couple of years. Uh, I like that aspect of it. We've mentioned the Chargers, the Commanders, the Falcons, the Seahawks. Are those your top four at the moment as you sit here? Yeah, those are probably my top four. I would I would say. Yep. All right. I think we all know who our worst one is. So I'm curious <laughs> to see how you feel about the other two. Let's go ahead and hit it and make sure. What is your worst job out there at the moment? Yeah, worst job's the Panthers, man. I'm not working for David <laughs> Tepper for, for any amount of money. I'm just not doing it. Uh, unless I'm – no, I'm not doing it. Because if you're, if you're a young guy, you don't want to have your first experience be with Tepper and maybe never get a second one. And if you're an old guy, you saw what he did to Frank Reich, and you're like, I'm not putting up with that crap. So, uh, yeah, Panthers uh, on the do not fly list. I agree, and I wouldn't have said that three years ago because they've been known mm -hmm. for stability and winning and at least pushing it to high levels at times. This is a dumpster fire. It's mm -hmm. a clown show. They are also two and a half hour, hours from me, kind of in my own backyard here. And this is a joke. I mean, they. This is. I don't have enough bad adjectives to describe what is going on there in Carolina. It is bad across the board. I don't know when it's going to change because the owner isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So, you know, I don't know when it changes. Somebody's going to get this job. It will be a great opportunity for somebody because they won't be able to get one anywhere else, you know. But having said that, it doesn't look good here. It it, it just looks bad. It's like this, that, this is the kind of thing that may kind of keep growing its own self and replicating its own bad self for a while until somebody can come in and change it. And I don't know who's, you know, who's good that's want to come, 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 come in and do that, you know. Yeah. And then I would put the Raiders and Titans kind of right at the same level for me, probably. I think both teams have uh, holes on the rosters. Um, I will, you know, if I'm coming in to be the head coach of the Titans, I probably also believe in Levis. So I feel like I've got a quarterback and I just need to put the rest of the guys around him. If I'm coming into the Raiders, I feel like I have a little bit more of a clean slate, a little more optionality, even though you've got Jimmy G stuck on the roster probably for another year, or at least his $28 million cap hit, whether he's actually on the team or not. Um, so you've got some, you, you've got some upward mobility, I think with both of those teams and some room to get better, um, but clear holes that you're really going to have to work through uh, for both those teams. I've got the Raiders slightly ahead on this job because it does feel like the energy and the optimism is a little bit higher. feels mm -hmm. like you've got a cleaner slate to work with. I think the Raiders organization is always going to be Raiders-ish. I just think it's in their yeah. DNA. They're going to do some some silly things. It doesn't mean that they can't also win along with it. So I don't have any worries there. It's just, oh, okay, you're going to have to put up with a little bit of crazy along the way. So maybe let's bring in somebody who can handle that, <laughs> right? But it feels like they're in Las Vegas. It feels like it feels like they've got a lot of good things going on and ready to win there. As opposed to Tennessee, I don't get a good feeling in Tennessee, just to be honest mm -hmm. about it. Man, I've got three other teams in the analysts I know You've got to compete in any division. But if I'm the Titans, I've already got three other teams in the division who look like they're pointing upward. 
I mean, especially Houston, good gosh. But I've got three other teams here that I've got to compete with, and, and I feel like I'm just flat. I don't feel like I have a whole lot of energy. And I also feel like I've got an ownership group here who may not necessarily know how to get what they want. They know what they want. I'm not sure they know how to get it. And so I'm not sure that I'm not always going to be battling that when they bring in the new general manager too. So, um, well, I mean, I guess they're keeping Osen for it. I shouldn't say the new general manager, but I don't feel great about the vibes in the building in Tennessee. So I, I feel better about Tennessee than I do the Panthers job, but I like the Raiders job better here myself. I, I would be a little worried. And again, if you're an NFL head coach candidate, you've got a little bit of crazy in you. You're competitive. You're probably not as worried about this, but I would be a little worried about if, if I'm the guy that they're keep taking instead of keeping Antonio Pierce, that locker room loves Antonio Pierce. Max Crosby, it was reported this morning by Ian Rappaport that he's considering requesting a trade if they don't keep Antonio Pierce. Now, that might just be him playing a little bit of leverage. But either way, like knowing that that's how far some of the players would go, if you come in there and you do a bad job, you could lose the locker room quick. Now, again, if uh, if ownership and, and front office, you know, they're – you're their guy. You you can ride it out and and be there to develop the next roster. Um, but I'd be I'd be a little worried. You got Devonte Adams, Max Crosby, some guys like that looking at you side eyed for you know through training camp. That that would make it a little tough, I think. See, I think if you're a new, if it's not Pierce, if you're a new guy coming in, I think you know you're going to suck next year because you're probably going to have to get rid of at least one of these veterans who was in love with Antonio. So I mm -hmm. think you kind of know that. And hopefully you have enough wherewithal to think, hey, I can I can survive a sucky year and get us to winning, you know, in year or two. But yeah, I agree. <laughs> I don't think if it's not Pierce, somebody's going to have an uphill battle for the next year to get that roster where they need it to be. Absolutely. All right. Anything else on the way out the door here, man? I think that's it. All right. Well, no matter where you're listening from, if it's off the YouTube channel or if it's off of one of our one of our podcasts, we really appreciate it. We've got a couple more uh, videos coming up in this series. So please hang with us. Um, come check us out and uh, have a great one. Bye.